in the days of these kings. The king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream but forgot its content. God revealed to Daniel the dream and the interpretation. Daniel 2, 31-44 Thou, O king, saw and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image had was of, of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his feet of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the shaft of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art the king of kings. For the God of heaven had given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven had he given into thine hand, and had made thee ruler over them all, thou art the head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom, inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdued all things, and as iron that break all this shall it break in pieces and breeze. And whereas thou saw the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou saw the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou saw iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of man, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to another people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Here is a table with the metals and the planets associated with these metals, and the signs and the houses. So, uh, gold is the metal of the sun, and sun is associated with the sign of Leo and house 5. An alloy of silver is the metal of Virgo, and Virgo is associated with uh, the uh, house 6. Mercury is the metal, uh, silver is the metal of Mercury. Copper is the metal of Venus, and Venus is associated with Libra and house 7. Iron is the metal of Mars, and Mars is associated with the sign of Scorpio and House 8. That was the order of the metals in the dream of the King Nebuchadnezzar. The head was of gold, the arms were, were of silver, the belly and figs of copper, and the legs of iron. So it is in, in the correct order, uh, indicating the sign of Leo, Virgo, Libra, and Scorpions. But the feet are part of clay, with which has nothing to do with Sagittarius, which would be the next sign. So far so good, until the iron, but not for the clay. But we know that the head is the time of Nebuchadnezzar, because Daniel says so. And Nebuchadnezzar, uh, that lived in the time of Daniel, is Nebuchadnezzar II, who ruled from 605 before Christ to 562 before Christ. 
So we'll make a progression starting in more or less in the middle of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar because he will rule for more 15 years after this year. This is the same year. In the Gregorian there is no year zero so it's 577. Uh, using the integer numbers there is the year zero and so corresponding to this year is 500, minus 576. We will make a progression of 48 years per house in this inner chart with respect to the outer chart. When this inner chart uh, takes one, one lap, it will be 12 houses, 12 times 48 years. It will take 576 years. That's why we, we choose this year. And the, in the meantime, the outer chart will progress one sign. We are starting Leo because Leo is linked with gold, the head of the statue that Daniel said it, it is uh, symbolic for the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Then the sign of Virgo, uh, uh, silver, the sign of Libra, copper or brass or uh, bronze and the sign of Scorpio iron the legs so a progression of 48 years per house 48 96 the time before Christ, the ascendant is Leo. Before Christ, Jesus is born, the ascendant is now Virgo. Another turn. The ascendant is now Libra, it's the low middle ages. Another turn, the ascendant now is Scorpio, it is called the high middle ages. In 1728, the ascendant starts to be Sagittarius until 2016, when it is exactly in the middle of the sign of Sagittarius, 15 degrees. And now, in the, in the next uh, years, we will be in house 1. We were in house 12 since. 1968 we enter house 12 and now in 2016 we will enter house 1 so this we pass through all the signs represented by the metals in the statue of the dream gold silver copper or brass or, or, or bronze and iron but here there is a problem because the metal for Sagittarius would be tin and the test at least in the translation says clay right it says clay and uh, I don't know how to, to understand this the first four were metals and were in the right order of the signs of the zodiac starting with Leo and the, until Scorpio it is gold, silver, copper and iron but now it should be tin and the test says clay at least in the translation if it was tin it was alright for this theory because the, the next sign is Sagittarius which is linked with Jupiter whose metal is tin there was an error of translation in Daniel 2. 
If you continue to watch, you will be surprised because I can prove it. It is tin, not clay. And tin is the metal of Jupiter in the traditional astrology, ancient astrology. And uh, Jupiter is linked with the sign of Sagittarius, as it should be after Scorpio, there it comes Sagittarius. Clay, there is no place for, for something that is not a metal in the symbologies uh, of the astrology. Every uh, sign has a metal associated with it, not clay. The first thing to be considered is the fact that the test is in Aramaic, not Hebrew. From Daniel 2, 4, the second part of the verse, until Daniel 7, 28, the language is Aramaic, not Hebrew. This is the maximum extension of the influence of the language Aramaic. In fact, it is more this more darker green here. This is the maximum extension of the Aramaic. But it wasn't very for a very long time in these places, uh, far from the darker green here. Oh, let's let's read it. In the centuries 16th and 17th, when the Bible was translated to the main modern languages, there wasn't many dictionaries of ancient Aramaic available, probably known. The Aramaic was still spoken by a few tribes in Syria but certainly it wasn't exactly the same Aramaic of 2000 years before because we are talking about the, the 16th, 16th century so it's 2000 years since Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar the second now it is 2060 uh, hundred years since Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar but a language can change a lot in this time in fact the important translation is the Septuagint because the others were very much influenced by the Septuagint which is a Greek translation made in the 3rd century before Christ but the word translated as clay is Hasaf Hasaf Het Samek P this letter P uh, sometimes has the sound of P of Peter and sometimes the sound of F of Father. When it is the last letter, as it is here, it is. Uh, it has this part below the the level of the letter. When it's not the last letter, it has not. This is the same word. It is an inflection, like in English. There is the inflection for the plural. One say house for singular, and houses for plural, right? So that less s for the plural is an inflection. In Aramaic there is also inflection. So it is the same word. Asaf can be this way or with the inflection this way. Het, Samek, P and Aleph. It appears only nine times in the Bible, always in Daniel 2, to inform the material of which the feet of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar's dream is made of. That makes it impossible to know the meaning by the contests in other passages of the Bible. Right? All the time, all the nine times this word appears is in Daniel 2. And always to, to, to say the same thing, the material of the statue. So you, you cannot uh, learn the, the, the meaning of this word from other parts. Uh, the context in other verses so if it is difficult because it is also Aramaic not Hebrew a language less known in the time of the translations here is the nine times Asaf appears always in Daniel 2 Daniel 2 Daniel 2 Asaf Asaf with the inflection Asaf 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 always translated as clay the for last hasaf 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 here's here's is be hasaf but this be only means with right bet it means with it, it conjoins with the word but it is still hasaf here be hasaf is just 
with clay. So what the translators use it to do is to check the Septuagint when they don't know the meaning of a word. Because Septuagint is a translation, translation into Greek very ancient. It is from the 3rd century before Christ, right? And the Greek language was very much well known, but Aramaic was not that much known. So they go to the Septuagint when they don't know. It was made in Alexandria, Egypt, in the 3rd century, and uh, it is said that it was 70, 70 uh, translators, but we don't know anything about these translators only that there was this translation and there was this saying that it was 70 and so the name is Septuagint the third century is from 301 before Christ to 200 before Christ about 300 years after Nebuchadnezzar this is another problem because it was not only Aramaic it was an ancient Aramaic even for the translators of the Septuagint it was already on Aramaic of 300 years earlier, right? Here is a sample of the Septuagint, Daniel 2, with the word that was used to translate Asaf, that end up being clay in the English translation. Ostracon. Ostrakino, Ostrakinos, and Ostracon. Because uh, Greek has even more inflection. But this is the nominative that is used to refer to the word. So we will refer to this word as ostracon. That was the word that translates asaf, which means here all, all the parts, all the verse that asaf appears in the Aramaic of the Daniel 2, always translated as ostracon. And the straco means shell, shell of the ocean, and uh, the beach is shell, ostracon in Greek. Ostracism is a, an English word that comes from ostracon. That's because the Greeks used it to vote someone out of the city using ceramic shells made of clay that they called ostracon too. In the picture, an ostracon, that is, a little well of clay on which an Athenian citizen wrote the name Themistocles, meaning that he wants this Themistocles banished from Athens. Usually they banish the public administrators whose politics were not working, ostracon. Ostracon also came to mean potter's shirt potter's shirt, piece of broken pottery of clay. Today the archaeologists call ostracon any piece of pottery that they found. What probably happened when they were writing the Septuagint Greek and the Vulgate Latin about 400 AD, 70, 700 after, 700 years after the Septuagint and the translations of the 16th and 17th centuries was this. The translator didn't know what the word hasaf in Aramaic mean, and used the fact that it seems to have the same root of hasafas in Hebrew. There was this word in Hebrew, hasafas, hasafas, and they thought it, uh, the first three letters are the same, as this hasaf that in Aramaic that we don't know what means. It, may, it must be close to the meaning of hasafas in Hebrew. Hasafas, Hebrew, hasaf, the, the two forms that it appears in Daniel 2, they might thought it was related words. Because Aramaic is a uh, related language with Hebrew, but it's not the same, not at all. There is quite a difference. Also, the translator may, may have thought that it was an error of the copies, that he should write uh, a Samek, 
and wrote an Aleph. And here, don't write anything, and made it clear that P was the last letter because it continued the, this appendix here, right? He was not just translated from Aramaic, he was translated from an ancient Aramaic of at least three centuries ago for him. Maybe at the time the translator learned Aramaic, Hasafi wasn't in use it anymore. The Septuagint translates Hasafs as Lepton. It appears in Exodus 16:14. Lepton and Hasafas means a small round thing. It was the food that fall from, from heaven to when the people was walking in the desert. A small round thing. This is the Hebrew word Hasafas that is similar to Hasaf, the Aramaic word, but only the first three letters. This last one is not present in the Aramaic Hasaf and it was supposed to be the same thing. So the Septuagint translated Hasaf, an Aramaic word, based on the word Hasafas in Hebrew. And uh, Hasafs, as we saw, Hasafs mean a small round thing, because it, it appears in Exodus 16.14, right? Uh, to, to mean a small round thing. But this time the translator was talking about the feet of the statue. He didn't want to use lepton as they use it in Exodus 16:14. But ostracon, the last one, it is also a, a, a small round thing, right? It is shell originally, but it had come to the meaning to mean this small round things made of uh, clay to vote. The last one leads the reader to think about pottery, which is compatible with the feet of a statue. They were trying to make sense of what they, they had to translate, because they don't knew what Hasafas, Hasaf in Aramaic was. The other word that's important here is Tina. Tina, it appears in two verses right after Hasaf, Hasaf Tina, Hasaf Tina. Here there is this bit, this bit means with, with. It conjoins with the, the word, but it's still Hasaf here, Be Hasaf Tina. It's a particularity of the Aramaic language. Tina, Tov Yod Num Aleph. The, the Tov that has the sound of T, the Yod that has the sound of A, I, the Nun that has the sound of N, and the Aleph that has the sound of A. It was translated as Myri, Myri, with Myri clay, with Myri clay. Behasafitina, Behasafitina. Tina is an inflection. The word is Tin. Tin, yes, tin. Tov, yod, num. Tov, the sound of T, yod, the sound of A, I, and num, num, final, the sound of N. So it is right, right, tin. Tin here, an English word. Well, it is right, in tin. Without inflection. The word is tin without the last letter Aleph in the left. That's right, it is writing tin in the Aramaic manuscript of the Daniel 2. The metal for Jupiter, the planet associated with the sign of Sagittarius, as we would think it should. It was translated with miry clay. They really didn't know what tin was too. So they, they thought it was tit. There was, again, a word in Hebrew that was more or less similar to tin and was tit. Strong also explains the fact that they translated 
from the Septuaginta already, and then in the Vulgata, and uh, all the languages of the 16th and 17th centuries. And every Bible today translates as clay, and Strong suggests that the translator of the Septuagint thought that the, it was Titi, in fact, that it was an interchange, by interchange or, or, or interchange only can mean an error, an error of the copyist, is what the, the translators of the Septuagint thought, according to Strong. Strong is a, an author of a dictionary from the 19th century, so it is in the public domain now, and uh, can be found in the internet. This site, uh, in particular, is very good for, to, to use the Strong's dictionary. It associates a uh, code for each word of the Bible. If it is from the Old Testament, it starts with an H. H2917 is the, the number of Strong for Tim. And uh, he put uh, before the, this tit. The theory of the translator of the Septuagint probably was that the right word was tit. And the copyist, instead of writing a tov in the end, wrote a nun and an aleph. As the translator also didn't know what tim means, he guessed that there was another error of the copyist. He supposed that it wasn't tin but tit. Tin is Aramaic, tit is Hebrew, and they know what tit is. Tit is miry or clay in Hebrew. So it helped the theory. They were they were willing to, to, to think that it was ceramics, the, 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 the material of the feet of the statue. And so think that it was not tin but tit help with this theory. But tit is not tin. And tit is Hebrew and this test is Aramaic. That's how the feet of the statue became of clay. That's how. Since the Septuagint, this is the Septuagint with this, those two verses, Daniel 2.41 and Daniel 2.43, that uh, appears Tina, Berhassav Tina, translated as Pelino Ostraco, Pelino Ostraco, Pelino is miry, clay, or dirty, in Greek. So since the Septuagint, it was translated as miry, clay, or dirty, Berhassav Tina. But Tin means well, Tin in English, you know that, Tin. Tov, Yod, Nun. T, Ta, Ti, I, N. Tin. Coincidence? Maybe not. Since about 2150 before Christ, the Middle East used it to buy tin from the mines of Cornwall, southwest of the British Islands. It's not unusual that a word pass from one language to another due to international trade. The fact that Tim, Tov, Yod, Nun, the Aramaic word that appears in Daniel 2, 41 and 2, 43 is identical to the English word for the metal in question, is a strong evidence that Tim also means that same metal in Aramaic. Because they used to buy Tim from the Cornwall, the British Islands. So there was, there was contact be between the people of the British Islands since the year 2150 before Christ with the place that speak, spoke Aramaic. They imported this word and uh, it's not only English. Uh, Welsh, Czech, Tsin, Slovak, Tsin, German, Zin, Dutch, Tin, Danish, Tin, Icelandic, Tin, Norwegian, Tin, Swedish, Tin, Estonian, Tina, Finnish, Tina. Finnish is not an Indo-European language. Uh, this language is more close to languages of the Central Asia. 
uh, nevertheless it imported a, a, a word for thin from the Indo-European languages. Hindi is Indo-European but not Germanic and this form seems to be from north of Europe, right? English, Danish, German, Estonian, right? Even in Sudan they have a word more or less similar to and there was mines of tin in Sudan in the time of the Bronze Age. This is the diffusion of metallurgy. Bronze is one of the first metals to be uh, used and bronze is uh, an alloy of copper and tin. So we don't have bronze without tin. Mines of tin here and here and in Galicia too. And here the place that they speak Aramaic. It's not uncommon that a word would come through the international trade from one language to another. Here's the diffusion of the Copper Age. Because Copper Age or Bronze Age is the same. It's not the, at the same time in every place. The archaeologists co uh, or the historians call uh, Copper or Bronze Age when they start to make bronze, which is an alloy of copper and tin. This darker brown here in the north of uh, Greece and uh, in the Turkish and uh, Syrian, the place that would speak Aramaic, more to the south here, Aramaic, right? But they had from the 4,000 4, years before Christ, the use of tin. And in 2000 before Christ, it was in the places that speak English, the place that speak Danish, which also uses, uh, has the, 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 the word tin for the metal associated with Jupiter. And there was mines of tin in the territory that today is Germany, that also has a similar word. Tin don't mix with iron. One can do alloys of tin with copper, lead, antimony, silver, etc., but not with iron. Because the test says that clay don't mix with iron, right? Tin also don't mix with iron. So it, uh, it continues to make sense if you interchange clay for tin in the test. It is soft and its melting temperature, temperature is only 232 degrees Celsius. So it is weaker, mechanically weaker than iron because the test says that uh, clay is weaker than iron and uh, tin is also weaker, right? There's no problem in substituting the word clay for tin. In the picture, solder used in electronics and other uses. Uh, usually on, a, on alloy with 60% of tin and 40% 40 of lead. But there is solder with 99% of tin, because some counters don't allow to use lead anymore in, in solder, because lead is harmful for the, the health, right? So, but it is still uh, soft, still maneable with the hands, very much soft, or in the, the, the biblical language of Daniel 2, weaker, the iron is stronger. Pelter is an alloy with 85% to 99% of tin. Since the age of bronze, is, it is made recipients of tin, a vessel, a jar of tin here is called pelter. Up to the development of stainless steel, early 20th century, it was common plates, cups and cutlery, etc. made of pelter but it is still used today. In the picture, jars of pelter, jar of pelter, cutlery of pelter, pelter, mm. 
this is to eat the ice cream from the 18th century. It looks like looks like ceramics of clay, right? Pelter plate. Suggested translation: Asaf dai perhar is what appears in the test, translated as potter's clay. We will translate now as artisan's pelter, right? We could use potter's pelter, because potter's is just someone that makes recipients, right? It, it doesn't mean to be of clay, I think. But I, we use artisans, but this word, pehar, pehar, is not important. You can use potter's if you want. It's just the man that makes the, the recipient be it of clay or, or tin, artisan spelter. And when it, when it was translated Mary Clay, it was Behasaf Tina. We will translate Pelter of Tin. Right? Hasaf Clay, we will translate Pelter. So it will be this way. And whereas thou saw the feet and toes part of artisan spelter and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou saw the iron mixed with pelter of tin. So nothing uh, is, uh, there is no problem in, in substituting uh, clay for pelter or tin, because uh, tin also don't mix with uh, iron. It will be a divided kingdom with the symbology using tin too. And, uh, the iron is stronger, mechanically at least is stronger. So it continues to make sense if you change clay for tin. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of pewter, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken, because pewter is more easy to break. That iron is from the ascendant in scorp that ended in 1728 already. Then the feet of tin, that means the ascendant in Sagittarius, and the toes only with a little of iron. S there is a lot of uh, interpretations that says that it is this, this same iron that was in the legs and came throughout the feet, so the, ho the whole feet has some iron. But I think the, the, the verse 42 says, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of pelter. So, only the toes are part of iron. And this is important for now, for, for, for us now. Iron is the myth of Mars. And Mars is associated with the sign Aries and Scorpius and the house 1 and house 8. So iron can mean these four things in astrology. We already used this meaning for the ascendant from 1152 to 1728. But now Scorpio don't make much sense. What we have now is house 1. We don't have much of Iris or house 8 either, but we have house 1. So the, the iron in the toes of the, the statue is, means house one. The tin in the toes is because the ascendant is still Sagittarius. But the iron is to show us that it will be in the house one. Since 1968, the time is in house 12. Now it is in the middle of Sagittarius, it will change to house 1. I think in March 21, when the sun enters Aries, the beginning of the year. So there will be iron in the next years. Team we have since 1728, but we, don't, we didn't have much iron 
now we have also one so this uh, talking about iron is just to tell us that confirming this interpretation that house one now right we don't know which year because it will be house one until 2064 until this year there will be tin and iron Sagittarius and house one it can't be after because there won't be any iron in this time here this would be house 2 where there is copper or brass or, or bronze but iron only until 2064 I consider this year very interesting because if you add another progression one of uh, four years per house the ascendant will be in house 4 in 2028 and house 4 is considered the house of the conclusions right but this is a very weak theory I'm not saying it will be 2028 but it is a good year it would make a lot of sense astrological Jesus says that they will say the sign of the Son of Man right in the in heavens I think there is a, a tip here but I can't say what it means in the days of these kings means Sagittarius and house one this is the king symbolically as it was Nebuchadnezzar in the year 576 right it's just symbolic it's not the, that, that man Nebuchadnezzar it's his time this king now is R Sagittarius represented by the tin in the toes and house one represented by the iron in the toes so please visit biblicalastrologyblogspot.com there we discuss the use of astrology to interpret Bible prophecy.